Welcome to Sunday Mornings at the Marxist Library. A quick note before we start, this session is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube with the link on our website, icssmarks.org, within the next few days. Also, our session today is co-sponsored by the Critical Theory Workshop. Welcome everyone to Sunday Mornings at the Marxist Library. For close to a decade and a half, our sessions were held at the Niebel Proctor Marxist Library located in Oakland, California. We are now hosting our sessions on Zoom and have speakers and attendees from throughout the United States and throughout the world. My name is Alan Miller and I will be hosting this meeting. I'm a member of the program committee that organizes Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. And I would like to start off by saying that we always welcome input, feedback, suggestions for topics and speakers. You can contact us through our website at icssmarks.org. Before we start, we wish to remind everyone that this is a comradely forum for political discourse and debate. As such, we ask that you show respect for our participants and the moderator of today's sessions. Please note that the opinions that are expressed here are those of the speaker and the participants. They do not necessarily represent those of the ICSS or the Marxist library. However, we are united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx, and we believe that his work remains relevant today. Our motto is taken from Karl Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, quote, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Our session today is titled, Are Fascism and Liberalism Partners in Capitalist Crime? And we have a very special speaker. Our speaker today is Gabriel Rockhill, political theorist, journalist, activist, and noted Marxist intellectual. Gabriel is the founding director of the Critical Theory Workshop, a professor of philosophy at Villanova University, and the author or editor of nine books, as well as numerous scholarly and general public articles. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to Gabriel. Welcome, and thank you very much for uh, speaking today. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. I will just share in the chat uh, right now, the Critical Theory Workshop is an educational nonprofit that I've been running since about 2008. And among our various activities, we run a summer school, Next summer, we're going to do the summer school online due to the fact that the Olympic Games are taking place in France, where we usually do the in-person program. But we've taken advantage of the fact that we have to shift online to really focus the summer school on uh, global Marxism and Marxism from the global south more specifically. So a lot of the speakers are people who wouldn't be able to make it to the global north anyway. So check it out if you're interested. Don't hesitate to circulate it. The talk that I'm going to share with you today is a kind of overview of a book that I've been working on for a number of years now, which has given birth to a few spinoff articles. So if you're familiar with some of the things that I've published on fascism, it might overlap with some of the things that I present in the talk. The title of the book is Fascism and the Socialist Solution. And I just kind of like to walk you through some of the basic arguments and then towards the end, I will share uh, some of the ways in which this framing of fascism and its historical development can provide us with tools for understanding the contemporary moment and in particular the situation in places like Ukraine and Palestine. So the first kind of conceptual intervention on, in this book is a critique of what I refer to as the ideology of fascist exceptionalism. The Holocaust industry has played no small part in the process of presenting fascism as an absolutely single, single singular phenomenon that appeared perhaps only once or twice in history, was ultimately defeated by the Western democracies, and therefore fascism is not something that is systemic to capitalism, but an exception to it. This, moreover, is presented as the kind of dominant ideology, or at least the liberal ideology concerning fascism, in a world in which uh, there's only one country that has been responsible for overthrowing more than 50 foreign governments since World War II, or at least attempting to overthrow them, been involved in innumerable assassination attempts against the leaders of uh, various governments, and in a minimum has its intelligence service that killed 6 million people between 1947 and 1987, all the while propping up dictatorships and running death, death squads around the world. 
And so this logic of fascist exceptionalism, of course, runs cover for the greatest imperial power in the world today, and that is the United States. So a lot of my work engages with fascism as a very important site of what I would call conceptual class struggle, meaning that the very concept of fascism is an important reference point for the struggles between different and rival ideologies. And in that regard, I don't think it makes sense to assume that fascism has some type of eternal essence that's been baked into it that we could define for all time. Instead, it is a site both of conceptual and practical struggle, and that for my research in the book, the most coherent approach to fascism is a dialectical approach. I mean a number of things by that that will come out through the course of my presentation, but one of them is that, as Lenin famously claimed, the world is so complex that its processes surpass human comprehension, and that any of the concepts that we establish in order to try to latch onto those con those uh, complex processes are of necessity limited in their scope. Therefore, with the concept of fascism, I think that it is very helpful with this dialectical approach to distinguish between at least three different levels of analysis in what we can call a kind of multi-scalar dialectical analysis. The first level of analysis is the most common within bourgeois approaches to fascism. It is the conjunctural level of analysis. The conjunctural level looks at a specific place and a particular time, such as Italy and Germany in the interwar period. Uh, in that regard, it is important to highlight, and I'll get on to the other two levels in a second, that fascism did not emerge within this conjuncture as a coherent ideology or a fixed set of ideas. Mussolini himself said, quote, fascism was not the nursling of a doctrine previously drafted at a desk. It was born of the need of action and was action. It was not a party, but in the first two years, an anti-party and a movement, right? So fascism as a concept became kind of consolidated within the Italian context, but it emerged out of an anti-working class movement that was quite inchoate and didn't have a consolidated ideology in a rigorous sense of the term. A few important aspects of that conjunctural emergence of fascism is, of course, the threat of the socialist alternative, which appeared on the world stage in 1917 with the Russian Revolution, and then was seconded by the fact that the capitalist world had been rocked by, or uh, was soon thereafter in the 1930s, rocked by the Great Depression. And so the conjunctural fascism that we see in places like Italy and Germany, as well as in Japan in the East, is in part an attempt on the part of the bourgeois state to develop a more radical form of authoritarian governance that could mobilize at least certain segments of the masses in the era of mass administered democracies. In that regard, these fascist endeavors relied extensively on mass communication and propaganda to target those sectors of civil society like the petty bourgeoisie, as well as certain elements of the lumpen proletariat and the proletariat, but with the backing of the industrial capitalists. And I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit more in a moment, but the capitalist backing of these fascist movements is integral to understand them. And that backing was uh, then further supported by a kind of nationalist and colonial ideology of radical transformation in order to crush the workers' movement and launch wars of conquest. So at this conjunctural level of analysis, I think one of the best definitions, at least operative definitions of fascism, is that put forth by Michael Parenti in his work, Black Shirts and Reds. He said uh, that fascism is nothing more than a final solution to the class struggle, the totalistic submergence and exploitation of democratic forces for the benefit and profit of higher financial circles. Fascism is a false revolution, right? It promises a radical transformation of society, but what it delivers is actually an ongoing war on working people. The second level of analysis that is important is a structural level of analysis. And this you often don't find within the bourgeois theories of fascism. 
A structural analysis doesn't simply look at particular spaces and times, such as Germany and Italy, but it instead examines specific phases of capitalist accumulation. And if you look at this level, meaning a structural analysis of capitalist countries in the interwar period, one thing that you find, and Martin Kitchen has pointed, uh, I'm sorry, published uh, pointedly on precisely this topic, is that in every single capitalist country, in the wake of the Great Depression, you had major fascist movements, right? And so the connection between fascism and capitalism therefore becomes much more apparent at this structural level. And it cannot simply be attributed as the bourgeois concept of fascism often does to the cultural particularities of Germany or of Italy. Because one thing that the bourgeois concept of fascism does is it largely describes fascism as a cultural phenomenon, as a superstructural phenomenon, and it doesn't mine down into the economic base. People like Jason Stanley or the other most famous theorists of fascism in the contemporary bourgeois world, of course, traffic precisely in these modalities of thinking. The third level that I think is important is a systemic level of analysis. So the historical materialist approach to this kind of a multi-scalar uh, analysis looks at the social totality and examines the ways in which the conjunctural developments of fascism in Italy, Germany, and Japan are nested within a larger structural development of the fascist movement in a moment of capitalist decline and socialist resurgence. But all of that has to be situated within the larger historical social totality of the systemic development of the capitalist world system. In this regard, uh, in the work of Marx and Engels, there was already an identification of the ways in which capitalism, in order to accumulate, relies on extremely repressive forms of parastate and state violence in order to uh, basically prime the capitalist pump, if you will, in what Marx uh, referred to it as so-called primitive accumulation, of course, a term that he borrows from bourgeois political economy. So Marx wrote that capital came into this world dripping from head to toe from every pore with blood and dirt. It came into the world through acts of brutal genocidal colonialism, through the enslavement of major swaths of the population, the indigenous population, the African population, and that this colonial heritage needs to be understood as the, uh, the forms of violent imposition of a capitalist system that predated the conceptual identification of fascism per se, but that resonate very strongly with some of the fundamental impulses that are integral to understanding what fascism is. And this systemic level of analysis that connects fascism to colonialism and the deep history of colonialism also allows us to see the ways in which the real struggle against fascism needs to be a struggle against colonialism. And it foregrounds the extent to which all three of the major uh, fascist countries that are identified as the main forces in World War II, Italy, Germany, and Japan, were invested uh, absolutely and totally in colonial endeavors. And so the colonialism that predated, you know, that predates fascism as a concept needs to also be understood as one of the driving mechanisms behind uh, fascism, even in its conjunctural sense. As I'm sure a lot of the viewers and listeners know, the Nazi rampage in the East against the Soviet Union was actually modeled on the US colonial rampage in the West and the Western frontier. And just as the US settlers were genocidally eliminating the indigenous population in order to have living room to the West, so were the Nazis planning on genocidally eliminating the peoples to the East in order to open up their Lebensraum or living realm in the East. And this is a very, very explicit connection, right? And Germany was simply one of the countries like Italy, and uh, Japan is a little bit of a different case for various reasons, mainly contextual within uh, within Asia. But they were the latecomers to the colonial feast, and they wanted to catch up with the great Western imperialist powers and even surpass them in their, uh, and they certainly surpassed them in the colonial appetite, even though they didn't fully succeed. In this regard, this multi-scalar analysis of fascism 
allows us to overcome the bourgeois concept of fascism and the ideology of fascist exceptionalism that I alluded to briefly before. I think that many people who are familiar with Marxist analysis are very uh, uh, attuned to the ways in which bourgeois ideology often passes a particular off for a universal. So that when the founding fathers of the United States claimed that all men are created equal, what they did not mean was that all people were actually created equal. What they meant is a particular group of white property-owning males were created equal. So they take the particular and they talk in the name of the universal, right? as if that was all people. What's interesting in the ideology of fascist exceptionalism is that rather than universalizing the particular, this ideological operation transforms the systemic into the sporadic, the structural into the singular, the conjunctural into the idiosyncratic. So it's the same basic ideological move, but in the opposite direction. Uh, it is the natural outgrowth of this bourgeois approach to fascism that conceptualizes Germano-Italian fascism as absolutely unique and defines it in terms of its epiphenomenal and superficial characteristics and never mines down into the capitalist roots, thereby obfuscating the structural parallels with other forms of repressive governance around the world and also in deep history. Moreover, this ideology of fascist exceptionalism more or less excludes materialist analyses and the use of the term fascism in certain other cases by trying to you know, maintain the idea that fascism was something that was just integral to particular cultures at specific times. This approach, I think, is problematic because it reduces the extent to which fascism is a product of the capitalist system, and that the way in which it historically emerged is not simply in opposition to modalities of bourgeois parliamentary, parliamentarian rule, but often hand in glove with them. And so let me say at the outset before getting into the second section of my talk, I'm gonna uh, go till uh, for about 45 minutes to an hour or so, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion after this. I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but it's often claimed within the bourgeois concept of fascism that the way that you fight fascism is that you defend liberal democracy. And at a certain level, I think it's very important from a Marxist vantage point to defend the gains of liberal democracies insofar as they at least purportedly maintain some zone for the rule of law, for a certain respect of human rights, for voter rights and things like this. And that we should not only maintain any that they have, but we should marshal all of our power to expand them as much as possible. So the argument that I'm making is not a kind of ultra left argument in which you just say, well, liberalism and fascism are the same thing, and we should just burn them both to the ground. No, they're not the same thing. But very importantly, and this is where my argument is headed, I think it's essential to recognize that liberalism and fascism are both modes of capitalist governance. And that if we seriously understand the material history of liberalism, we have to recognize the ways in which it has often worked hand in glove with fascists, empowered them, and allowed them to operate precisely because they often function as the bad cop of capitalism to liberalism's good cop. And so to refer back to what I just mentioned about pushing back against any kind of ultra leftist confusion, I think that it's very good to have a good cop as opposed to a bad cop if we're talking about who's in control of state power. But at the same time, the whole goal of the good cop, bad cop interrogation routine is to confuse those being interrogated and make them believe that salvation lies with the good cop of capitalism, not with the abolition of the entire system of the good cop and bad cop or the kind of hegemonic rule and repressive rule by overthrowing capitalism in the name of socialism. In that regard, uh, if we look at the history of liberal governance, one thing that we need to recognize is that it has often collaborated with the rise of fascism. And we see this within the conjunctural form that fascism took in the interwar period. In October of 1920, 20, uh, 1922, it was magnates in the Confederation of Industry 
and major bank leaders that provided Mussolini with the millions of dollars necessary for the march on Rome in a kind of spectacular show of force. But Mussolini did not seize power. Instead, and Daniel Guerin has uh, highlighted this quite poignantly in his book, Fascism and Big Business, that I'd recommend. Mussolini was summoned by the king on October 29th of that year and was, according to parliamentary norms, entrusted with forming a new cabinet. The capitalist state thereby turned itself over without a fight, but Mussolini was intent on forming an absolute majority in parliament with the help of the liberals. So it was the liberals who supported his new electoral law in July 1923, and then they made a joint slate with the fascists for the election on April 6, 1924, the fascists, who had only had 35 seats in parliament, gained 286 seats, thanks to the help of the liberals. The case of Hitler is somewhat similar. Uh, he would, in, in two cases, in two aspects, one is that they both received capitalist banking, both from national capital and from international capital, particularly U.S. capital, and it was the liberals who aided and abetted his rise. So Hitler claimed in a famous speech on October 19, 1935, that he had the material resources necessary for supporting 1,000 Nazi orators with their own cars who could make some 100,000 public meetings in the course of a year. And all of this was due to his financial backers, uh, the Ford uh, family in the United States and other financial backers here but also uh, industrial capital in Germany. Prior to the election in uh, Germany in the 30s, the Communist Party candidate Ernst Thälmann had argued that a vote for the conservative field marshal von Hindenburg amounted to a vote for Hitler and for war. And of course, after Hindenburg was elected, he invited Hitler to become chancellor. So fascism in both of these cases came to power through bourgeois parliamentary democracy, and they were bankrolled by big capital, and the candidates did the bidding of big capital while also creating a populist spectacle, a false revolution that marshaled or suggested some mass appeal. Um, of course, there were also activities that both the Italians and Germans were involved in that were extra parliamentary, that were illegal, et cetera, right? So it's not as if they only abided by the norms, but they did follow those norms within the kind of public spectacle of gaining power. After they gained power and consolidated it, this was quicker in the Nazi case than in the Italian case, they then did go much more full on authoritarian. They became engaged in crushing organized labor, eradicating opposition parties, destroying independent publications, putting a halt to elections, scapegoating and eliminating the racialized underclasses, privatizing public assets, launching projects of colonial expansion, and investing heavily in a war economy beneficial to the industrial supporters. So it established a direct dictatorship of big capital. An important aspect of this analysis, of course, a lot of the bourgeois approaches to fascism are rather, rather flat-footed, and they don't track out how fascism actually changed quite a bit in both Italy and Germany through the course of time, so much so that even the more left-wing elements within both Italy and Germany's fascist movements were cut off in order to consolidate this more authoritarian right wing as things evolved. It's also important within this larger context, of course, that the other purported liberal democracies of the West were not fighting fascism, right? The capitalist states refused to form an anti-fascist coalition with the Soviet Union, a country that 14 of them had invaded and occupied between 1918 and 1920. Uh, and during the Spanish Civil War, Western liberal democracies did not officially support left-leaning government that had been elected. Moreover, in 1934, the United Kingdom, France, and Italy signed the Munich Agreement, in which they agreed to allow Hitler to invade and colonize the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. So they gave him a, gr a green light to colonial uh, fascism. And indeed, it was the fear of being left to confront Hitler alone, which eventually drove Stalin since 1934, the unswerving champion of an alliance with the West uh, against Hitler, into the Stalin-Ribbentrop Pact of August 39, which he hoped to keep the USSR out of war and buy him time for developing the productive forces as much as possible to defeat the Nazi war machine, which he, of course, and the other Soviets knew was coming. 
Uh, this did, in my reading on this particular uh, agreement, was that the pact was not a pact of uh, somehow solidarity between the fascists and the communists. On the contrary, they were not allies. This was a very tactical decision because the uh, the Soviet leadership had been backed into a corner and they just needed to buy themselves time in order to build up their military and their defense uh, capabilities. In this regard, the overall kind of depiction of conjunctural fascism needs to be written, and fortunately there's great work on this front, in terms of a capitalist backing and strong liberal aiding and abetting. I would like to point to the fact that the US backers of capitalism also included the uh, big capital within the United States, as well as some of the important forces that were operative within the US national security state. So Ford, General Motors, Standard Oil of New Jersey, and DuPont had all become deeply involved and invested in Germans' weapons production in the interwar period. And in fact, American investment in Germany had sharply increased after Hitler came to power. Uh, according to Christopher Simpson's excellent work on this front, Commerce Department reports show that the US investment in Germany increased some 48.5% between 1929 and 1940, while declining sharply everywhere else in continental Europe, right? So in this regard, uh, fascism in Europe was astroturfed, right? Not, it wasn't simply a grassroots movement and fascism, as far as I've been able to see in my research, I've not found examples of fascism that is purely grassroots. I've always found instances of astroturfing. Astroturfing, of course, means that instead of a grassroots movement coming from below, there are capitalist ruling class elements that plant the seeds by funding fascist movements and trying to foster them as much as possible. One of the important uh, legal firms involved in foreign direct investment in Hitler's Germany was Sullivan and Cromwell, which of course was overseen by or, or part of the leadership of Sullivan and Cromwell was the Dulles brothers who would go on to become the uh, the head of the um, uh, U.S. state uh, department on the one hand and the head of the Central Intelligence Agency on the other. And they would make sure in the wake of World War II that these financial investments were protected. Uh, I'll just touch on this briefly in passing, but we should all know, of course, that fascism wasn't defeated by Western liberal democracies. It was defeated by the colossal sacrifice of approximately 27 million Soviets and approximately 20 million Chinese. The war against fascism was fought and won in the East. Only some 400,000 U.S. Americans gave their lives to the war fighting uh, against fascism. Of course, this pales in comparison to what the Red Army did and the overwhelming bulk of the uh, Nazi war machine was run in the uh, run in the East. In that regard, if we just stay for the time being on this conjunctural level of analysis and then attach it to the more structural level of analysis, I think that anyone who's educated within the imperial core generally affiliates fascism with Nazism and fascism perhaps in Italy, but they don't think about fascism within the US context. And so I'd like to just briefly outline some of my research on precisely that topic because as I mentioned earlier, there were very important fascist movements in every capitalist country as of the late 20s, early 30s. And in the case of the United States, we came very close to a fascist coup d'etat. And in 1934, the mccormick dickstein Committee of the US House of Representatives, after weeks of investigation, concluded that, quote, certain persons had made an attempt to establish a fascist organization in this country, end quote. The plot did eventually uh, fail, but it was a plot to overthrow FDR's government, the New Deal government, and then to, uh, to set up a dictatorship that would be fascist and that would be controlled by the capitalist ruling class of this country. I'll get into the specifics in a moment. This emerged out of an organization called the American Liberty League. Dimitrov, if you're familiar with his excellent analyses of fascism, claimed that in contradiction to German fascism, which acts under anti-constitutional slogans, uh, 
American fascism tries to portray itself as the custodian of the Constitution and American democracy, right? So we have American exceptionalism, the freedom discourse, and all of this that's baked into the very name American Liberty League. Uh, there were a lot of other fascist movements in the states at the time, the Ku Klux Klan, the Sentinels of the Republic, the Crusaders, the Silver Legion of America, the German-American boon, Friends of New Germany, the list goes on. These are the historical predecessors to the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, and the fascist organizations that we have operative today. Many of them also uh, emerged directly out of uh, military, uh, the military establishment in various ways, a lot of impoverished veterans who became members of these uh, organizations. In the case of the plot in the United States, which is referred to as the business plot, it's the Morgan interests, DuPont, Rockefeller, Pew, and Mellon that were the principal backrollers behind this planned fascist coup d'etat. Of course, some of the most famous robber barons in the history of the world. And they worked with high profile political figures in the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the party of slavery, that party, uh, the party of mass incarceration, the party of genocide in Gaza, that were opposed to the New Deal and wanted to roll back the New Deal. In that regard, they made the plan to hire a man by the name of Gerald G. Maguire, who went on a four-month research tour of Europe to visit four different fascist countries and study which version of fascism would be the best one to implement in the United States. And he supported drawing on France's Croix de Feu movement, which is a fascist organization that was composed of some 500,000 commissioned and non-commissioned officers. And so it was drawing on the military and using veterans in order to then implement, their plan was to implement Hitler's unemployment plan in the United States. Of course, that unemployment plan was so successful because it involved forced slave labor. Uh, Maguire then considered General Smedley Butler to be the ideal leader of the movement, although they were also considering Douglas MacArthur, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., uh, and other commanders within the military. They were going to use the pretext of the president's ill health this is uh, FDR, uh, so that then the leader, Smedley Butler, who they'd chosen would become a kind of figurehead like, uh, I'm sorry, the president would become a figurehead like the king of uh, Italy, and then the fascist leader could take control of the government. They were going to honeypot veterans into doing this, and they had arms via Remington arms secured by the DuPont interest because DuPont had a controlling shared interest in Remington arms. And they were going to pay the veterans a bonus from World War I that they were owned, owed by the US government, but the US government kept refusing to pay. And so they were going to honeypot the veterans into marching on Washington. They had planned to only pay them one year. So it was obvious that they were just going to use them. They weren't going to pay the full bonus. They were going to use them until they got their fascist in office and then uh, shift the government out of parliamentary elections and go full on fascist. This was not the only conspiracy that was revealed. Um, there were others also that involved uh, various conspirators, but it's the most well-known one. It's thanks to John L. Spivak, who was a uh, communist journalist at the time, that he actually was able to get a hold of the full transcripts of the McCormick-Dickstein Committee that weren't released to the public and weren't shared with journalists. And so we, now we have all of the internal investigations that prove that this wasn't a you know, conspiracy that people were thinking about. It was a conspiracy that they were acting on very, very concretely. The other element in this uh, kind of counter history of fascism that I've been developing that I think is important is that the bourgeois idea of fascist exceptionalism often claims that fascism was defeated in World War II. I've done a long art and detailed article on this. If anybody's interested, I'm just going to touch on a few of the highlights called uh, the U.S. did not defeat fascism in World War II. It discreetly internationalized it, right? And we know from the history of the U.S. empire that it's always been opposed to socialism and particularly 
uh, hostile to Soviet style socialism. And they were involved in trying to overthrow the USSR in from 1918 to 1920, and then were involved in the blockade against it, etc. But it was not even the wake of World War II. It was during World War II that the US national security state began working very closely with Nazis and Italian fascists, and later it would do the same with Japanese fascists in order to integrate them into the US national security state and into intelligence services around the world in order to establish a veritable fascist international in order to keep doing the important work of Hitler and Mussolini, and that was fighting the workers' movement. Uh, I'll just highlight a few aspects of this. Reinhard Galen, of course, was the head of the intelligence services of the Nazis. He was a general in the Third Reich against the Soviet Union in the wake of World War II. Instead of being put in prison as a, a, as a war criminal, he was brought to the United States, taken to a Yankees game, met with all of the major architects of the U.S. national security state, and then put back in charge of the new democratic intelligence services of West Germany. And he proceeded to then hire thousands of the Nazis with whom he had been working in order to continue doing the uh, purportedly important work, at least from the point of view of the national security state of the United States, in fighting communism in Germany and in the East more generally. Eric Lichtblau has estimated that some 4,000 Nazi agents were brought to the, to the United States. Um, Operation Sunrise was run in Italy, doing the same thing with uh, members of the Italian fascist network, including very high commanders like uh, Valerio Borghese, known as the Black Prince, often identified as being the leader of the neo-fascist movement in the wake of World War II, was protected by James Angleton and the uh, OSS that became then the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, the numbers that I said about Eric Lichtblau were incorrect. His estimates for how many were brought to the United States were 10,000. 4,000 was the number that he estimated of Nazis integrated into German intelligence services, right? Um, we probably all are familiar with Operation Paperclip that brought 1,600 Nazi scientists, Hitler's doctors of death, to the United States. Provide them, provided them often with research funds, promises of American citizenship, hooked them up with U.S. universities. There were some 14 of some of the most prestigious universities in the country, including Cornell, MIT, and Yale that participated in Operation Paperclip. They were also brought over with their families. And I'll also reference Operation Gladio, in which the CIA and MI6, the more or less CIA equivalent in Great Britain, set up secret stay behind armies in every country in Western Europe, including neutral countries, that they proceeded to stock with Nazis and fascists in order to continue fighting a war of subversion against the East and to be purportedly ready for a Soviet invasion of the West. And then they would run subversion campaigns against the communists. But they were mobilized in the strategy of tension, uh, particularly in Italy, Germany, and Belgium, in order to commit acts of terrorism against the civilian population that were blamed on communists and socialists so that they could be targeted for uh, being rounded up and thrown in prison. This has all been extremely well documented at this point in time. There's uh, through the Italian courts that that found that this was this conspiratorial organization that was not beholden to the liberal democracies of these countries. Uh, that was established in the early 1990s. The European Parliament has a resolution on it, and I would greatly recommend the documentary work of Alan uh, Frankovich, both his film on company business on the Central Intelligence Agency and his film Gladio on the Stay Behind Armies actually has a lot of firsthand accounts of those involved in these enterprises talking about it rather candidly. In that regard, then, we have to understand that the bourgeois state in the imperial age does not simply function according to what the spectacle of politics dictates to the masses and via its corporate media reach. It also functions, importantly, driven by what Annie Lacoiris refers to as the men and women of the shadows, meaning that the invisible government, 
the some people call it the deep state, the intelligence services, the national security state, or the more nefarious and hidden aspects of the national security state, often have done the opposite of what the spectacle of politics claims that it is doing. And one of the reasons for the US national security state hiring so many fascists from Italy and Germany, and the same is true in the case of Japan, is precisely so that they could contribute to an international fascist network that they could use to fight against uh, workers' movements around the world. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave that section uh, as it is, I'm happy to return to uh, any of this in the, in the final discussion, but just jumping ahead a little bit, I think that if we look at the contemporary moment, then one way of approaching uh, current fascism is by breaking with the one state, one government paradigm, which is so widespread within liberal debates. It's the assumption that either a country is a democracy or it's a fascist, it's fascist and that there's no room for an analysis that would be a variegated analysis of degrees, for instance, or a dialectical analysis of different levels and forms or modes of governance within particular countries. What the one state, one government paradigm tends to foster then is the idea that, well, uh, fascism is only a real threat if it takes over the government, and if it doesn't, then we don't have to be as concerned about it, or it's simply as a threat or something that creeps in or other things like that, not a reality that actually affects people's lives right now. Against that, I think that a dialectical approach to fascism has to embrace a multiple modes of governance model, meaning to take seriously the ways in which the capitalist ruling class manages the general population through different means at different points in time, and that part of that management is through the hegemonic work of the visible government and of the forces that are operative within the kind of spectacle of politics. But in the phase of imperialist capitalism, in which there is an increasing discrepancy between the very tiny ruling class and the amount of wealth that they own and control, and the masses of workers globally, there's an increasing reliance on other forms of governance that are often parastate forms of governance, so parallel to the state, and often engage in and work with criminal elements from society in order to mobilize forms of repressive governance that often contradict the hegemonic modes of rule and the rule of law, and in fact, uh, traffic in illegal practices. In that regard, uh, it's important to note that when fascism rose up in Italy, there's a lot of really interesting uh, journalistic work that was being done in the United States that said that, well, what the black shirts are to Italy, the KKK is to the United States. It's just their version of the KKK. And so the United States, we should recognize, has a longstanding history of using parastate forms of governance to target the racialized working class in order to repress them by any means necessary. And that those forms of governance need to be understood as part of the overall structures of capitalist governance. The multiple modes of governance model then allows us to better understand why it is that liberals would be so tolerant of fascists why it is that they insist that there's an absolute principle of free speech that needs to be preserved in the case of fascists, but can often be thrown under the bus when it comes to socialists or communists because these are the people who are beyond the pale. Uh, we also know that with the January 6th hearings, the US government has treated the fascist organizations that were involved in this as well as the leaders with kid gloves. Right? Instead of being immediately thrown in prison, as they would have been if they were members of the racialized working class in this country, or if they were trying to storm the government in order to set up a socialist form of government, they have been treated with the utmost form of liberal tolerance, which then begs the question of the extent to which, and I alluded to this earlier, but I'll just sum this part of the talk up very quickly. I think that if we see fascism and liberalism as two modes of governance within capitalism. The liberal mode of governance tends to be used as a kind of good cop 
for those sectors of the population that can be ruled hegemonically because they are willing to acquiesce. So the basic deal is if you stay in your lane, don't get too organized, don't try to overthrow the system, don't try to overeducate people, then you can vote for a capitalist candidate that we choose for you. You can have certain minimal rights as established by the Bill of Rights because we'll keep basic kind of structures of legality in place. That form of hegemonic rule mainly targets the middle and upper middle classes, the professional managerial class stratum, and uh, that is how it tends to operate. Another mode of governance, though, has been operative throughout the history of the United States and other capitalist countries, and that is a mode of governance that is used against the colonized populations, the neo-colonized populations, the racialized populations, the immigrant populations, etc. That mode of governance tends to be the bad cop of capitalism in which the rule of law is out the window, respect for fundamental rights disappears, there is no right to vote or other such things. Instead, it is reliance on repressive violence that often takes two different forms. It's either the direct repressive violence of the state through ICE and through the police and the FBI and things like this, or the various vigilante organizations that the bourgeois state works very, very closely with. These can be the Klan, these can be the three percenters and the other organizations that I was alluding to earlier, but they work hand in glove with one another in order to exercise this mode of fascist or fascistic governance, whatever term you prefer, in order to keep that population down, right? Now, there is a difference between a bourgeois form of rule that has liberal governance for the middle and upper middle classes and fascist governance for the more insurgent forms of the racialized underclass. That said, this is quite different than if the hegemonic mode of governance goes full on authoritarian and full on fascist, right? So I think that we need to have different levels of analysis. And as I mentioned earlier, not just go down a kind of ultra, ultra leftist position that says, well, liberalism and fascism are the same thing. No, we should fight for the rule of law. The more rule of law that we can have, the better it is for building power, organizing, keep a lot, keeping our people safe, et cetera. So my final comments, five to 10 minutes here is that there are uh, at least two or three elements I want to touch on, and this is more kind of acts of provocation for the discussion, if you will. So start formulating your questions or writing them in the chat or doing whatever you need to do. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on three of them very quickly. One is, and I've detailed this in a very long article that I wrote for Counterpunch, I think that the January 6th event needs to be understood as a, an inside affair that was overseen by elements of the U.S. government, the military, and the U.S. national security state, and that this was not a grassroots movement from below. It was astroturfed from above by members of the capitalist ruling class, in particular someone like Anna uh, Masuglia, who dedicated some, uh, I think it was $4.3 million to the January 6th organizers and other elements of the extreme right-wing capitalist backers of these movements. And the, of course, Donald Trump was uh, very much played a very strong role in this. And what's remarkable is if you look through the history of the organizations who were involved in the January 6th uh, storming of the Capitol, they have very, very strong ties to the military and to the bourgeois state in various ways. If I can find it, I'm just scrolling through some of my notes. There's a really interesting uh, set of analyses put forth by a former FBI agent. I'm not finding it right now, but uh, I can find it if somebody wants it, who basically says, you know, the, the leaders of these movements, these fascists, we know them because we've been working with them for years, right? This is a member of the FBI. I think his name is Mike German, who's, who's saying this. And so it's not just that this was these were kind of fascist outsiders. They were fascists who were astroturfed and backed by the capitalist ruling class, the most reactionary elements of it, and certain elements of the bourgeois state that opened up the gates to power and let them in. And I think we have to see all of that together. The other two examples, again, I'll touch on as a kind of form of provocation for the discussion, is the case of Ukraine and the case of Palestine. In the case of Ukraine, if you have a bourgeois concept of fascism and you reduce fascism to a culturalist undertaking, then you can easily collapse it into something like cultural anti-Semitism and fall into the trap of saying, well, Zelensky has Jewish heritage, therefore 
Ukraine couldn't be fascist? Or is Israel as a self-proclaimed Jewish state couldn't somehow be fascist because fascism and anti-Semitism somehow go together because fascism is understood in a culturalist form as hating or targeting just one specific group of people. As I mentioned earlier, I think this is an incorrect approach to fascism. Fascism needs to be understood in terms of the economic base and what's driving it. And the ideologies that it mobilizes will differ varying or based on the target populations. And so in the case of Ukraine, it seems very uh, uh, the overall framework of what's going on in Ukraine is that you had a Russian separatist movement in the East, which had historically been the bastion for the industrial working class and the communists, that since 2014, when there was a US-backed fascist coup d'etat in Ukraine against a democratically elected leader, that region said, we don't want to be under a fascist under fascist rule, we want independence. And some, I believe, 14,000 people approximately were killed between uh, 2014 and the onset of the special military operation on the part of the Russians. And the way that Ukraine was fighting a lot of these separatist movements in the East was by the Azov Battalion, Adar Battalion, other battalions that are extreme right-wing fascist battalions, who are backed by the capitalist ruling class in Ukraine, in particular Kolomyovsky, who happens to be, I think he was, the last time I checked, he's the third richest oligarch in Ukraine, backed not only Azov, but other battalions that were later integrated into, Azov was integrated into the Ukrainian National Guard. He also was one of the principal supporters for Zelensky's presidential run, and he was invested in the television platform that ran the show where Zelensky was as an actor playing the future president of, or the, the president of Ukraine that he would later become. So much so that many people now see that TV show as basically a long advertisement campaign for his run for office. So you have the same capitalist power interested in funding fascist militias, and funding uh, the government that granted Zelensky's you know, political platform isn't explicitly fascist in the sense of the extreme right-wing parties that also are operative within Ukraine, and the control of the parliament of those parties is, is, is minimal. But if you look at what has happened in Ukraine since the special military uh, intervention in the East, what you have is a totalitarian state that has shut down alternative media, uh, canceled and banned uh, opposition parties, thrown socialist and communist leaders into prison, and is involved in a kind of draconian police state that has now punted elections. And so elections are you know, being pushed back further and further. And in that regard, I think that we have to be able to see that, yes, there are very strong cultural fascist elements and militias that have been integrated into the National Guard operative within Ukraine and undertake a dialectical variegated analysis in which you look at the different fascistic elements and there are some semblance of elements of a kind of parliamentary democracy, if you will, but there's no longer any elections. There aren't opposition partners, parties. There's not opposition. There's no opposition press. So it's been completely gutted. Uh, moreover, Ukraine has been become one of the centers of uh, international organizing of fascists, and it has been that for quite some time. The CIA has been working for 70 years in Ukraine, running assets first against the Soviet Union, now against Russia, of course. And so I think all of that has to be factored in to understanding what's going on in that case. I'll just say very briefly regarding the situation in Palestine, that if you have a culturalist bourgeois understanding of fascism, then it prohibits you from being able to see a fascism that would be mobilized by a self-declared Jewish state. However, if you bracket that and you instead take a historical materialist and dialectical analysis, looking at the economic base and the deep history of Israel, then you have to recognize that what we're dealing with, according to the Zionists themselves, is a colonial project 
backed by the major imperialist Western powers, of course, Britain taking an important role early on, the US taking that over a bit later. In uh, And one of the principal goals of that longstanding colonial, settler colonial imperialist project is to take over land, natural resources, proletarianize the extant population of these regions, and also have a beachhead in an area of the world known, of course, for its extremely important natural resources, uh, you know, oil and gas being the, the first and foremost among them. And so within that much larger context, then Israel can be recognized for what it is, and that is an imperialist-backed settler colony that is quite clear about what it is that it's doing. Its political leaders have said it time and time again. We now have the most recent ICJ uh, uh, ruling that doesn't quite yet go all the way, but at least says that there's ample evidence to investigate Israel for undertaking a genocide with imperialist backing. But the target of that genocide is the Palestinian people. And they are the ones who are being racialized and targeted for elimination. And we're now at a level that far surpasses the Nakba of, of 1948. And of course, the Nakba has been ongoing. It's been an endless catastrophe. But if you just look at the numbers in 1948 and you compare them to the numbers today, they're double or triple that, uh, depending on what sources you look at, et cetera. So in that regard, I think that the historical materialist and dialectical approach to fascism is absolutely essential for understanding the contemporary world, because then we can see that fascism also operates, and these would be my final words, and we can open it up for discussion, as the cutting edge of imperialism. When you need to dispossess people, beat back alternative threats, and make sure you impose capitalist relations by any means necessary, right there at that cutting edge of imperialism, where NATO's pushing to the east in the case of Ukraine, where the Israeli army is dispossessing and pushing out the Palestinians in order to take over all of Gaza, at least that's certainly what it's looking like now, and make it into, just incorporate it into Israel, and the same similar things are going on in the West Bank, then what you have are two imperialist endeavors that can and I think should be conceptually framed in terms of the history of how fascistic modes of violence are operative within the history of capitalist driven colonialism. So that'll be my final word and we can open it up for discussion, debate, questions and comments. Wow, thank you very much. Boy, we have a lot to uh, talk about. Um, in a moment, we're gonna go to the question and answer part of uh, today's session. Um, in doing so, what I'd ask people to do is to go to the reactions button and raise your hand. Uh, if you have questions or comments, we'll come back to it in a moment. Uh, but uh, get ready. I think this will be a great discussion. Uh, before we do, I just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, first of all, for future programs, we have an incredible lineup of programs uh, coming up in the next month. Um, the first one next week will be on criminalizing Palestinian solidarity. Uh, three British comrades indicted under the anti-terrorism law. Very, very special program. We put this up uh, very quickly. I, I don't know how much people are following what's going on in the UK, but um, uh, three uh, comrades at a uh, pro-Palestine demonstration were arrested for distributing uh, hate literature. Uh, and then other comrades have been targeted using the 2000 UK anti-terrorism law, facing some very serious charges for basically organizing uh, resistance to the uh, US-British imperialist uh, war on Gaza. This really represents a world historic um, uh, development that we should be very concerned about here in the U.S. We're going to have Dr. Ranjit Brar, one of the people who was arrested for on the hate crimes uh, um, uh, arrest, and uh, he'll be speaking about what's going on for the cases for all the comrades. I'd also call your attention to the fact that the Oakland School District and the San Francisco School District are under federal investigation on the basis of uh, for promoting, quote unquote, uh, violations of civil rights and hate uh, for sponsoring teach-ins on um, the, I believe the teachers union 
sponsored some teach-ins on um, Palestine. Very, very important uh, uh, next week. That's why I'm giving you a little bit of extra time to encourage people to attend. The following week on, Fe on uh, February 11th, we have Harpal Brar from the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist-Leninist. Uh, he is going to be speaking on his book, Socialism with Chinese Characteristics. A uh, very interesting book. I've read it, very informative, and some very provocative ideas about what's going on in China today. Um, our next speaker on February 18th, this is going to be a talk that is um, uh, corresponds to the two-year anniversary of the Russian intervention, special military uh, operation in Ukraine. We're going to have a Ukrainian Marxist based in the U.S., woman Slava, speaking out against Ukraine's regime and NATO on the second anniversary of the special military operation. This is going to be a really interesting session. A lot of uh, personal um, information. Uh, she's from Western Ukraine, so she's not from the East, a, a, a Russian ethnic, but talking about at the ground level, and also after two years, kind of looking back historically, what uh, uh, you know, what's actually happened, what we can say today, and what we've learned uh, about what's what's happened in Ukraine and the significance of it. Uh, the following week, on uh, February twenty fifth, we have another very special speaker from London. We have Andrew Feinstein, uh, author of Shadow World. Andrew was yes, born in South Africa, a uh, Jewish family who was active in the anti-apartheid movement, and he will be speaking on South Africa's case at the ICJ. He's going to be talking about apartheid in South Africa, what are some of the lessons that, have, that were learned from the fight against apartheid, and how they can be applied to the fight against apartheid in Palestine and the war in Palestine very important uh, talk. Um, other stuff coming up after that, the best way for you to uh, find out about our sessions is to go to our website, icssmarks.org. When you come online to the website, a, a small box pops up, a sign up box, enter your name and your email address and you will receive email notices every week with upcoming programs. Also on our website are uh, a way of contacting us and many of our past programs going back ma uh, many years that are um, actually um, up uh, for uh, as videos. So we have a tremendous uh, um, set of upcoming programs and we really wanna encourage people to join and sign up, et cetera. Okay, so <laughs> I'm looking at the, uh, at the stack Everybody, please be patient with us because we have a lot of people. I want to ask everybody today in particular, we had, we've had we had over 50 people on this. This is one of our larger uh, sessions. I'm going to ask people to please try to keep your questions or comments to about two minutes. I'm going to kind of watch that a little bit more closely. Ask one question at a time, maybe two, but one question, try and keep it in the, in the interest of time. Come back. You're welcome to come back and ask questions. And also, please respect, I'm going to try and take people in a certain order. Um, please respect the fact that I'm really trying to uh, uh, run this thing smoothly. So let's start off with the um, the first person who, uh, who will be speaking will be, um, let's see, let's have uh, Mehmet, name sounds familiar, uh, followed by um, uh, Sharon. So... Let me go ahead and um, uh, allow the participants to unmute yourself. So Mehmet, if you would unmute yourself and ask your question, go right ahead. Thank you, Alan. And uh, also I'd like to uh, thank the uh, speaker. It was an excellent presentation, uh, very impressive. Uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, mention that there is a confusion in the left on what is fascism and what is not. And it is a real question because unfortunately, we have been given only the models of Italy, Germany, maybe Franco, you know, those uh, models. 
And so, unfortunately, people have not been able to go beyond that as imperialism uh, developed, as capitalism developed to today's stage. And so there is a confusion on whether, you know, we, we have fascism here or there or not. So the confusion comes to uh, identifying fascism as, you know, being a, a mass movement, which you have gone in there. Thank you. That was very impressive that we don't have to have a massive movement to have fascism. It could come top down. You mentioned that very well. And that top down starts with the state, the capitalist state and the reasons why. The, uh, they would need fascism is um, mostly in the state of crisis. But we have to understand in this stage of capitalism, in this stage of imperialism, both capitalism and imperialism are in crisis. But which means that then we will be shifting more towards fascism in many countries as we have been seeing. But more than that, the neo-colonial countries that are dependent on imperialism have been in crisis all along. They all came to being after the Second World War in the stage of imperialism, in monopoly capitalism, and they were born into a crisis. And the crisis that the neo-colonial countries face are constant. There's no way that they have good days and bad days, good years and bad years. So what it means is that the crisis is consistent. The crisis is constant, which means the uh, uh, when you have the lack of democracy as a tool to rule the people, especially in the new colonial countries, it means that fascism, the way of spreading the people, does become the mode everyday mode. And the confusion that I mentioned about is that, you know, people ask, well, there's, 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 a, a, you know, democracy, there, there are unions, the workers, there are associations, there are, uh, you know, the parliaments, election, doesn't matter. They are show. They are show. And the real rule becomes the rule of the capitalists, the rule of the uh, financial uh, uh, monopoly uh, that is tied to imperialism. And I really thank you for bringing up the ties to imperialism in the age of imperialism, especially in the neocolonials. Is it even possible to have a bourgeois democracy? If not, then what do we call it, if not fascism? Thank you very much. Very impressive uh, presentation. Okay, Gabriel, usually what we do, we take one question at a time. You're welcome to make comments. Uh, we'll try to keep it, keep things rolling. But why don't you go ahead, Gabriel, and then we'll take the next question uh, after uh, Gabriel from uh, Sharon, followed by Mike Hoey. So, uh, Gabriel, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think it was more of a comment, but I really agree with it and appreciate the, the nature of the comment. But I, I will say that if we understand fascism as the mobilization of usually state and parastate violence that's backed by the capitalist ruling class and allowed to act by the bourgeois state, that these forms of violence do tend to intensify in moments of crisis. And those crises can because there's an external threat, like the threat of a socialist alternative, but it can also be internal threat, socialism internally, or capitalism's own inability to solve the contradictions that it produces in the first place. And that if you look in the contemporary international context, there are many, many political economists who have pointed out that neoliberalism is running out of speed, uh, out of steam. Uh, the rolling back of the social welfare state only goes so far and then there's nothing more to roll back and you just really start destroying people's lives at a more rapid pace. And depending on where people are situated in relationship to the kind of contemporary struggle between imperialism and the socialist alternative. I am of the camp that identifies socialism with Chinese characteristics as a reality, not as something that the Chinese aren't doing. And so I do see the Chinese experiment, if you will, because all of these are ongoing experiments, as attempting to do a certain form of socialism that differs from Soviet socialism, it differs from Vietnam, it differs from Cuba, et cetera, for very specific historical reasons. 
and that the rising prominence of China and its growth rates, which have been truly, truly incredible uh, over basically since 1949, but if you take out a few years of the kind of cultural revolution, it's almost been at 10% per year, and they're only now starting to slow that down in the name of developing a more environmental civilization, which there are global leaders in, then the contemporary crisis is not only that neoliberalism is running out of steam, it's that there's a country, regardless of where you're positioned on this, it's a country that calls itself socialist, at the preliminary stage of socialist, that is uh, now surpasses the United States in purchasing power parity. If you look at it in those terms, it's the strongest economy in the world. And it is uniting with countries around the world in an alternative development project. If, it, if it's BRICS, if it's the Belt and Road, if it's, you know, there's a whole series of different networked modes of development that, again, we wouldn't want to describe them as socialist developmental projects, but I do think it's coherent to say that they're not the imperialist model of development that's been shoved down people's throats through imperialism. And so in that specific context of a very powerful socialist country and an alternative model of international development that isn't the imperialist model of the West, regardless of how you end up defining and describing it, means that the crisis is that much more intensified. And I think it's precisely for that reason uh, that those two reasons of capitalist crisis internally and an alternative externally that we have seen more fascism rising within the capitalist countries and we're going to see a lot more of that in the coming future it's one of the reasons that we not only have to understand it but we also have to study and develop very important tactics for fighting against it and be clear-eyed about what the principal strategy for fighting against fascism is and that's the establishment of socialism there's not fascism within socialist countries there's fascism within capitalist countries that are under threat in crisis, trying to do anything that they can in order to remain in power. So I'll leave it at that and let us go on to the next question. Yeah, just a quick reminder on February 11th, we will have Harpal Brar talking about his book, which is very relevant to what you were uh, just talking about. Next up is uh, Sharon, followed by Mike, followed by Roger. So uh, Sharon, please go ahead. Unmute yourself. Um, can you call on me later? Because it, my question is... Okay, uh, let's go ahead, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. I have a couple of historical questions. One is dealing with the role of the World League for Freedom and Democracy. I think it was started in 52 by Chiang Kai-shek, originally called the World Anti-Communist League. And I'm wondering if they were just kind of a paper tiger or if they actually played a, a part in what was going on in the 50s and 60s. And the second thing is about Unit 731. How many of the scientists from 731 were actually employed by the U.S. or the Japanese state? And was it a lot similar to Germany, or was it just kind of like a minor thing? Great. Uh, wonderful questions. I'm not really familiar with the history of the World League for Freedom and Democracy. I have to look into it. Maybe other people know more on the call. So apologies for my ignorance on that front. I am familiar with Unit 731 and its heinous experiments on human subjects using mainly communist prisoners of war to do the most horrific things imaginable to human beings, or at least the worst ones that I've ever read about, freezing people alive and then chopping off their limbs and seeing if they could be sewn onto another body, doing uh, live autopsies so somebody was alive and they would just, you know, no anesthesia or anything, just dissect them uh, on the table. And the his name is escaping me right now. Perhaps you know it, but I believe it was the head of Unit 731, a very famous Japanese scientist who oversaw a lot of these heinous experiments, was hired immediately by the Central Intelligence Agency in order to share all of his uh, knowledge and also expertise in the heinous things that he was doing with the West. I also know there's, I actually haven't read it yet, but I just came across recently, there's a whole book on Unit 731 that I wasn't familiar with, and I'm going to read it very soon. Um, so I'm sure I'll find out more there. Or hopefully there'll be more information there, but that's all that I have on that on that front. I don't know the exact number of people who are integrated, but in Japan, you know, they basically took the leadership of fascist imperial Japan, and with a few tiny exceptions, they put them back in power, and they used the liberal party, you know, that, that's the name of the party in Japan, as basically a bastion for fascists, 
so much so that the individual who signed the declaration of war against the United States was run through the CIA clean, cleansing machine, you know, brought up to speed on what his new job was, and then put right back in power. Um, and so in the case of Japan, it's, it's, it's not only very similar to Germany and Italy, it actually in many ways surpasses Germany and Italy, because in Germany and Italy, they, you know, they use Adenauer, and they basically used uh, liberal aiders and abettors that could allow them to continue doing what they wanted to do sub rosa, that is the United States wanted to do in Italy and Germany. In the case of Japan, it was the visible government that itself was just in deep continuity with the imperialist fascists. So, and the last thing I'll say is I think it's really important. So many of the bourgeois approaches to fascism are absolutely imperial centric and they only talk about Europe. Japan's role in all of this is quintessentially important. And as I mentioned earlier, World War II was really fought in the East. And that we need to understand because it was a war between imperial fascism and uh, socialism in the case of uh, China, Korea, Vietnam, uh, Soviet Union. At least there were struggles already that were going on that were pushing in that direction in those Eastern countries. So I'll leave it at that and go on to the next question. OK, next up is uh, Roger, followed by Janet. So Roger, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, OK, th th thank you, Gabriel. Very good, very uh, helpful. Um, some of the highlights, I think, for me was the criticism of the one state, one government paradigm and the suggestion of having a multi-modal uh, um, model of governance that was very useful. Of course, your comments about Ukraine were very um, right on tar targets. Um, the whole multi-scale levels of fascism um, really helped me conceptualize uh, th those those issues and, and such. Um, I'd like to hear more about the taking this this framework, this intellectual framework, and applying it to contemporary U.S. politics. Um, uh, particularly, you made a um, very valid criticism of uh, the ultra left criticism of um, bourgeois democracy, where you don't want to throw the baby out with the bear, bear, bathwater. You use the uh, you use the uh, analogy of the good cop, bad cop. There's a danger there that 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 can slide into um, lesser evilism and how you avoid that. But um, I think I'm going to keep that question in abeyance, if, maybe if I get a second chance to another bite of the apple, I'll ask that. But I, I want to ask a, a much more practical area of questions. And and that that is um, about your, your own um, development of thought in the critical theory workshop. If, if you could, could you probably try to characterize for us what um, the critical theory workshop and, and your own work um, what what are the essential elements of that that distinguishes it as an element within Marxist thought? So that would be the first part of that question. Um, and so how how would you characterize that that tendency? Second would be what allies are there right now developing within international um, Marxism? Um, what similar t tendencies are there right now that you would call allies or collaborators and stuff like that? Um, th uh, third was, um, what, what is the potential of having some sort of um, organizational form that consolidates some of those tendencies? And an example would be, um, you're probably familiar with the left forum um, that, that comes out of New York City. It, it, it's sort of a bit of an abeyance since the COVID crisis, but um, something um, that would be for the, what I would call, for want of a better term, the, an anti-imperialist um, analysis of, of world politics, uh, some, some sort of maybe meeting or some sort of um, organizational form, and, 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 what, and then finally, what are the opportunities for collaborative um, projects? Thank you. Thanks so much, Roger. That was very, very rich. I can't help myself but to say very quickly regarding fascism in the United States that, you know, what we're facing with Trump-Biden is basically 
a choice between two candidates who agree on a lot. They're both for a capitalist war on workers on the home front and for the perpetuation of imperialist wars abroad. There are minor differences between the way in which they wage those two wars, but that's what they really agree on. But it is true that there's a third element, I think, in the case of Trump, and that is really empowering a fascistically oriented uh, base and trying to astroturf that base as much as possible. And we saw this with January 6th. We've seen this with a lot of other things that Trump has done and within the Trump world. And that does cause a kind of level of threat to the very hollowed out and empty form of bourgeois democracy that we still have operative. And so I think that variegated analysis is, is important. Um, we could get into that in greater detail if you want, because I think it's a really pressing uh, question and issue. It's also an, a question of why the Democrat, why the Democratic Party is is running to lose, because they clearly are. You know, Biden can barely talk at this point in time. It's almost laughable from any from anyone from the outside who would look at this would say, well, they're running so that Trump gets in office, as they have done in the past, right? When they ran Hillary Clinton, and everybody knew that Sanders would have won against. Uh, against Trump and there were studies that demonstrated as much. And so it raises questions about the larger level of collusion on the part of the capitalist ruling class. They obviously fund both parties, although some of it, you know, some of certain sectors of the capitalist ruling class are more directed toward the Democrats and some are more directed towards the Republicans. But there is a kind of level of crisis going on within US imperial hegemony that makes it such that I think that there's a, a large segment of the ruling class that's saying, well, why don't we try out something a, the, a little bit harder uh, this time around and see if we can get our goals uh, met. So bracketing that anymore though, and turning to the critical theory workshop, I mean, the main goal is to have a platform that has academic credentials and is taken seriously and not just dismissed as something that's engaged in real world politics and therefore shouldn't be taken seriously by academics, for instance, or journalists. And the tendency of thought, I think you characterize well, it's anti-imperialist Marxism. Um, anti-imperialist Marxism that also is not afraid of, and in fact, actually advocates for a serious, rigorous, scientific engagement with socialism, not just as an idea, socialism as a practice. Socialism that needs to be understood in terms of movements, of parties, of states, et cetera. And that there's a lot of the kind of Cold War ideology that I've been subjected to that assumes that all that you can do is criticize capitalism and that's what unites us. But we don't really need a positive project. Or if we do have a positive project, it's in a kind of utopian socialist mode or a third way politics. I think times are worse than they ever have been, right? The nuclear clock is closer to midnight than it ever has been. Environmental degradation and the loss of the biosphere closer than it ever has been. This level and fascism is more intense now than it ever has been, at least in my lifetime. The crisis is at fever, fever pitch. The utopian socialist directions, they've been tried out. They've been very present within the Cold War, but they're unsatisfactory, I think, in my opinion, and I know a lot of young people who are also oriented in that direction. Let's open up the spectrum of analysis and take actually existing socialism seriously. There's a lot of allies for the work that we do. Uh, we've collaborated with a lot of different institutions uh, internationally, and so most of them are on the website. The collaboration that we're doing right now, uh, I think, is an example thereof. But I'd like to focus on the last thing that you say because I think it's so, or said because I think it's so important is that I've been having a lot of discussions with people about the need for a larger platform or an organization that operates at an even higher level that could bring different organizations together and have something like an association, an anti-imperialist association, for instance, or you know, come up with some other name for it that would bring together and kind of federate between different groups that might have different tendencies or various different approaches, but would provide a framework, a platform for debate and conversation and discussion. And I think it would be important for that kind of anti-imperialist association to draw on people who are working more in an academic setting perhaps, or journalists and working kind of professionally, if you will, in knowledge production, but also activists and party leaders and union leaders. Something along those lines, I think is really, really necessary. And so, but I'm still, at least at the level of my discussions and organizing, having conversations with people about how to do that, how to maintain control over it so it's not poached by 
certain political tendencies or poached by the capitalist ruling class. And so I'd be more than happy to follow up this conversation in brainstorming further about what we might be able to do. Uh, and, and I think it could be done and should be done with strong international connections because there is actually being launched next year, there's a new international Marxist association that from what I understand is gonna be a kind of umbrella organization for national associations. And so if we were able to get something off the ground, then we could affiliate ourselves with that as well. And I think we'd have to do it as non-sectarian as possible so that we'd all be learning and engaging, but also have kind of a principled position regarding the importance of struggling against imperialism and for socialism. So thank you, Roger. That was really rich. Okay, next is uh, Janet, followed by uh, Kit, followed by Raj. And um, I want to encourage people who are first time attendees at session, raise your hand and ask a question. Don't be intimidated. Don't be shy. Go ahead and uh, speak up. So go ahead, Janet. Okay, thank you. This has been a wonderful presentation. I am so appreciative for all your work. Um, I, by the way, uh, uh, Zelensky ran as a peace candidate, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. Um, anyway, I'm I'm wondering if you would clarify if you consider colonialism as a phase that. Uh, happened prior to capitalism or is a branch of it or was a branch of it. Well, we still have uh, Israel, but um, but that said, I have uh, three questions. Uh, Actually, let's let's try to <laughs> keep it down to maybe one or two. OK, I know Roger slipped a few in there, but go ahead. I, let me ask them and then uh, you can choose whichever ones. Um, okay. Could you talk more about where the Trump Biden um, uh, where they, you know, the, those two, the uh, Republican Democrat, um, uh, falls into the fascism liberalism parallels in uh, in the U.S. Um, can you also talk about where the Muslim countries fall into your paradigm? And finally. Uh, uh, would you talk a little bit more about mil uh, about uh, physical force, uh, that aspect of capitalism, the military and police states? Great. I I'll try to be quicker in my responses as well, because these questions are really rich, so I want to hear them all. And I'll continue thinking about them after our conversation. Co I, I think that... Uh, Colonialism is is baked into the history of the capitalist project because it is about taking natural resources and land and dispossessing people, etc. And that, as Lenin said, by the time we get to the late 19th, early 20th century, the colonial project has saturated the world. But that doesn't mean that colonial endeavors are over. It means that there's a struggle over who gets access to those colonies or who can produce new colonies. And so I think that uh, understanding how colonialism shifts under uh, the imperial phase, which I believe is still operative today, would be important. Regarding Trump and Biden on liberalism and fascism, I mean, Trump and Biden are both people who support the uh, fascist elements of imperialism globally and who have empowered, to some extent, fascists uh, domestically. Although Trump clearly is much more of the camp of those who are trying to empower a domestic form of fascism, Biden is, you know, has not really cracked down on the fascist movements in these countries. Like if, if the three percenters and the Oath Keepers and movements like this were Marxist movements, all these people would be in prison and there wouldn't be, you know, there probably wouldn't even be hearings for that matter. Uh, in this case, though, they're really they have been treated with kid gloves. There have been some prison sentences going as high as I believe 15 years was the highest one that I saw. But there's not a real attempt to crush the fascist movement in this country. And there won't be from a Democratic candidate, in my opinion, because the good cop always wants to keep the bad cop on call. And they want to appear like the good cop and do things to present that image, but they're not going to crush the alternative. But Trump is very dangerous. And I think that we should be sober and clear about that. He is going to, as he already has, very much empowered 
a fascist movement on the ground, and he's going to leverage as much governmental power in his direction as he can. And that's dangerous. And so I think if we have this more dialectical analysis of fascism at different levels, we can see, yeah, there's some support for fascism that both of them agree on. But Trump does surpass at the domestic level certain in, in certain aspects. Muslim countries and fascism, I think a big part of my future research and kind of bringing this book hopefully to a close is also looking at the ways in which the United States has mobilized Islamic fundamentalism for imperial ends. And that this has been one of its principal objectives in its imperial endeavors in the 21st century, working, uh, you know, hand in glove with the, uh, with the, if, you know, this goes back to Afghanistan and the, the, the kind of Afghan trap that was run by the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department, but it continues up to today with trying to foster terrorism on the part of the Uyghurs to all of the splits between Sunnis and Shias in the Middle East. There's a real attempt to foster the kind of more fascistic elements of uh, Islamic fundamentalism. Um, I don't know if that's where your question was headed, but that's definitely where my, my mind went. And then the last thing is that the U.S. police state, the mass incarceration system, the extreme levels of repressive violence unleashed by the state on immigrant communities, I think we have to see all of those as not somehow separate from fascism, because there's a tendency to think, well, fascism, bourgeois scholars differ on this. Sometimes people will say, well, fascism is just when fascists have control of the state, or others will say, well, fascism is just vigilantes and parastate actors. But I think it's important to recognize, no, this is a porous phenomenon in which the state, the bourgeois state, often acts hand in glove with parastate actors. These can be vigilante organizations. Organized crime is very, very big and very important for the way in which fascism is mobilized. They can be Islamic fundamentalists. They can be many different types of groups. And that there's a real porosity between the two. And that's what we have to be able to see is how, you know, I'm sure some people have seen memes like this, but does it make a big difference if you're getting beat up by a cop during the day or if it's at night and you're being harassed by the KKK, if the person wearing those uniforms might be the same person and often historically has been the same person. It's just during the day they've got a job and at night or on the weekends they happen to be in a militia or an organization like the Klan. And so part of my work is trying to really see and, and detail specific events at which we really see that coming to the fore, right? The history of the white power movement in the 70s and 80s is quite interesting because a lot of it comes out of Vietnam vets. People were coming back from U.S. imperial wars abroad, subjected to quite a bit of mistreatment on the part of the U.S. government as being vets, but then aligning on a U.S. imperial project against the immigrants on the border, uh, primarily in places like Texas and in the Southwest. And so you see these people who are formatted by the military industrial complex and then doing work within the civil sector that basically parallels the work that they were already doing within the military. And it's that type of fluidity that I think historical materialists really have to understand and, and bring to the fore. Okay, we're gonna go next with uh, Kit followed by Raj. So Kit, if you would unmute yourself and ask your question followed by Raj. Okay. Yes. Kit, your your sound is really breaking up. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, it's not, not doing too good. Maybe you could go out and come back in. Give it a try, okay? Can I put my stuff? Yeah, put it put, put in the chat. Go ahead, and we'll get to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. You. In the meantime, okay. In the meantime, Raj, go ahead. Okay, uh, Gabriel, thank you very much uh, uh, for the presentation. Uh, so I have two questions. First is, uh, given that G7 is backing Israel's genocide, enabling it, standing by Israel uh, against much of the world, um, would you characterize them as fascist states now? So that's first question. Second question is, how do you see Modi-led government in India, which uh, you probably know that Indian communists call either fascist or neo-fascist, but it is also uh, working, with, uh, working with Russia and China, China, which you say is a socialist project, uh, China and Russia, which are opposing uh, fascism, uh, 
So in how do you see Modi government? The second question is more important. The first one is also important. So if you have time only for one, answer the second one only. Yeah, they're great questions. Thank you. I think that it's a, a dialectical approach has to look at the kind of different levels. And our if I could use a kind of philosophic reference point, Hegel always encouraged us not just to think at the level of understanding, and if you think of the level of understanding of fixed categories that have an essence to them, and that's it, and they're stable and fixed. So it's either fascism or it's liberalism. And a lot of debates, I think, unfortunately get locked into this idea of, well, it's just this or just that. A dialectical approach thinks at the level of what Hegel called reason, and that is that these are complex historical processes with different dimensions. And we can do a fine-grained analysis of them that overcomes all the limitations of the kind of bourgeois ideology. So I just preface that or say that as a preface to insist on that, like, if we use the label fascist, that's obviously going to mean something quite strong. But if we're able to do a kind of variegated analysis, we can look at different levels. And so in the case of G7 countries, they actually differ a little bit between them, right? Like the United States is really the driving force behind Israel, and it has been since at least the 60s. Would we call the U.S. a fascist state? Well, the U.S. aids and abets and supports and has been, I would argue, the principal driving force behind fascism internationally, at least since World War II, if not before that. Uh, at the same time, it maintains a bourgeois democracy on the home front, elections and rule of law and a kind of good cop relationship to its professional managerial class strata. So that's not the same thing as a fascist state that would abolish all of that. Uh, and But it is also increasingly moving. I mean, you just look at the his historical spectrum of politics in the U.S. and it's just been moving to the right for a very, very long time. And so there's an increasing kind of drift, if you will, in that particular direction. Um, and But what one of the things I like about your question that I'd like to insist on is that sometimes people say, well, fascists are the guys with baseball bats who are beaten up people. And they don't say, well, the fascist is Henry Ford, who paid for thousands of people with baseball bats to beat up the workers. We have to see both of them as playing a role and the capitalist ruling class as having a lot more power than a guy with a baseball bat or a gun or whatever else they might have. And so I think it's absolutely true that we have to look at the real drivers behind fascism, and that's the capitalist ruling class and the bourgeois states that work uh, with them and for them. Yes. Regarding the, the Modi government, I think uh, a lot of people are better experts than I am on India, but the best analyses that I've seen uh, mm -hmm. are analyses that highlight the way in which Modi himself kind of came out of political movements that themselves had were very strongly rooted in fascist movements. There's a very strong, you know, uh, Hindu nationalist orientation that, of course, culturally mirrors what a lot of other fascist projects have done. There's the unleashing of vigilante violence, the use of the state for that type of violence, the uh, all of the repressive uh, crackdown on uh, workers, on Marxist journalists and intellectuals and things like that. On all of those fronts, I think it's manifesting fascistic modes of governance 100%. Uh, on the international stage, India is in a little bit of a different situation, right? It is at certain levels proximate to the West and taking certain lines that are closer to the imperial countries or the historical imperial countries, but it is also involved in developmental projects of a kind of bourgeois nationalist sort with other countries of, of the East. And so once again, I would say that we kind of need a dialectical analysis. And maybe the last thing that I would say is that since the term fascism and the concept is so important, it often is central in organizing uh, situations where at times it can be really important to say, look, we did our variegated fine-grained analysis and it seems that the country is like 80% fascist and maybe 20% keeps a semblance of a parliamentary democracy. But for the purposes of our organizing and the class struggles that we're engaged in now, we're going to come out and we're going to say that it's fascist because we need the clear lines of demarcation to be drawn. And so I do think we have to relate the kind of more fine-grained work that I've been talking about to the need to draw a line in the sand and say, no, this is fascist, and therefore we're fighting against it on this front. Um, so I just kind of want to add that into the equation because uh, 
it can be two different things when we're on a Zoom call talking about fascism as we are now versus if you're on a Zoom call talking about, well, we're organizing an anti-fascist front and we got to be clear about where we stand and we can't have, you know, Professor Rocchio give some long expose about the various levels of analysis. So that type of tactical definition, I think, is really important. Maybe the very last thing is neo-fascism is not a term that I, I particularly support because there's been a tendency to say that, well, fascism was defeated and now it's resurgent. Fascism wasn't fully defeated. Fascism is continuous with the capitalist uh, governance. And so I think that just calling it fascist and calling it Nazi is, is the way to go as opposed to adding the prefix neo. But we okay, can go um, question or cycle back. Sure. Uh, next is, uh, let's actually have Jonathan, uh, uh, first time participant. Go ahead, Jonathan, ask your question, followed by Sharon. I will get to everybody, I promise. So, and I'll Jonathan, be if you want to unmute. Yes, go ahead, yes, Jonathan. Uh, um, hello, um, and I'll stay off camera because I have my daughter with me. But uh, first, I want to endorse the Critical Theory Workshop. I attended. I'm also a Patreon member, so I recommend it to everybody. And Professor Raquel, my question is more about, um, I'm wondering if you had any thoughts regarding fascism and like the use of the welfare state to quell the militancy prior and during the civil rights movement. That's a great question. I think the the biggest historical frame that needs to be used to understand the welfare state in the imperial core is the threat of socialism. That given the fact that workers in the East had access to free or affordable housing, healthcare, education, uh, employment, et cetera, that this created a context in which the Western struggle for social services took on greater power and that the capitalist ruling class decided on a class compromise. We're going to give to the workers basic social benefits so that we can shore up our hegemony and rule at least segments of the um, of the workers hegemonically. And in that regard, that has had, uh, of course, an impact on modes of organizing um, but it depends on what time period we're talking about, right? Because the social welfare state as it existed at least in some form in the case of the United States as of about the 1970s in the neoliberal turn has just been gutted ever since then. And so we're now living in a world where increasingly everything has been privatized and any semblance of a social uh, safety net is withering away very, very quickly. If it, it you know, any, if any of it's even left in certain uh, segments. Um, but I take it that, and this is maybe the last thing that I'll say is that part of your question is motivated by, well, how does the social welfare state relate to reformism versus a more revolutionary form of socialism? And it is true that, and here I would reference, of course, the great work of Lenin and others who highlighted how social democratic reformism often really settles in within the imperial core when there are class compromises that are made from above, as well as a labor aristocracy in the imperial core that is buoyed by the colonial enterprises. And that combination of social welfare state, social democracy, and labor aristocratic social standing internationally does make or has historically made a context within the imperial core where a lot of those who are the more privileged sectors of the working class have a vested interest in keeping the capitalist system going as is because they are beneficiaries of that system. And that has tended to work against the interests of the more revolutionary socialist orientation. And it's also one of the reasons that some of the more radical forms of uh, organizing in a country like the United States have tended to come out of the racialized poor, some of uh, those who are really at the end at the bottom, really, of the, the labor pools, because they're not benefiting as much from the social welfare state, from the wages of imperialism and colonialism, and from social democratic rights and things like that. Uh, so hopefully that answers at least some of your question. Okay, hey, next will be Sharon, followed by Jean, followed by Yusuf. So Sharon, go ahead. Thank you. So um, on on Palestine, so I think it's very 
true that it's an apartheid state and with an analogy to South Africa. And, but what can we learn from the history of South Africa? So at some point, the ruling class woke up and decided that they could either have a bloodbath or they could let the Afri the, the uh, black population uh, have some equal rights as the white working class, and they could exploit both, which they are now doing. Um, and um, in, in in the Israeli working class has never acted as if, or rarely acted as if they needed the Palestinian working class to exploit. Um, even though they lack workers, that's why they import people from Thailand and the Philippines and other places. And um, they have historically had people from Gaza working in, in Israel uh, Green Line and or people from the West Bank being able to work inside of Israel, although that's much less or practically none, none now. Um, so when, why can't the Israeli work, uh, ruling class, you know, have a similar um, um, stance toward getting rid of apartheid in the interest of making more profits? That's a, it's a good and interesting question. I don't know if I can give a really straightforward answer. That was more a rhetorical uh, question, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, what you've highlighted and I think brought to the fore in an important manner is that when there is an insurgent class that has been uh, racialized, subjected to apartheid, taken, had their land and natural resources taken away, et cetera, that there are different ways of managing those populations. And I take it that you're suggesting that Israel is doing that in a way that's even surpasses what South Africa yes. uh, did, right? Um, that's, I mean, that's, yeah, that's an important point. It is also related to the way in which, you know, uh, Emmanuel Ness has an excellent book on this that deals with immigration as, as, as a form of imperialism or migration, I should say. And that is that if, Israel can rely on even cheaper labor from abroad due to the kind of international flows of immigration and then just push out the Palestinians and take all push out or kill the Palestinians take all of their land because I'm sure we've already seen that they're designing projects for Gaza and already you know they've got the beach resorts already designed for what's going to go in after they just bulldoze the entire place and so I imagine that whatever those backroom conversations are, they have to do with a calculus concerning the cheapness of the labor pools and also the, you know, the ways in which colonialism and the specific forms of racism that it takes on usually tends to target the population whose land is being taken away. And so uh, in that regard, I do think that the situation at least is a little bit different than the South African situation. Maybe the last thing that I would say on this, and this is a little bit of a different comment, but it relates to the earlier question by Jonathan, and that is that this has often been a case that capitalist ruling class and bourgeois states have faced. That is that there's so many forces rising up from below, and how do they manage insurgencies? And in the case of the United States, if you look at what was going on in the, you know, in the 1960s, for instance, within the more revolutionary elements of the Black liberation struggle, that was a similar problem. Either we just crush these people and we keep segregation and we're going to have a lot, we're going to discredit ourselves internationally and nationally for that matter, and it's just going to be a bloodbath. It already was a bloodbath to some extent, but it'd be even worse. Then what do we do? And what the U.S. decided to do in that case, I think, is quite revealing, and that is that they really, you know, legally, they said, okay, well, everybody has the same rights, but we know that de facto that's not at all the case. But then they also propped up a black professional managerial class. And the Ford Foundation and the corporatocracy was involved in this very explicitly, and they knew exactly what they were doing. They were basically honeypotting people who were leaders from the black community who could play the role of being kind of leading reformists who were pro-corporate, uh, amenable to black capitalism and things like this. And then they could create what's now called a kind of black misleadership class. And so you desegregate in principle, and then you only allow a few up so that then you can point to them in a form of tokenism and say, look, these people succeeded. 
And so it's a different form of segregation that's not the exact same as apartheid, but structurally and at the level of economics, it still basically operates in such a way that the masses of Black people are kept in working class or even lower positions than that as a kind of surplus population. And so it'd be interesting, I just say this because it would be really interesting to look at different counterinsurgency tactics, right? Look at Israel, look at South Africa, look at the United States and see the different tactics, why they were used, how they succeeded or failed in various ways. So there's a lot more that could be said, but these yeah. are rich questions, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I would call everybody's attention to the fact that on February 25th, Andrew Feinstein, this is something that he's spoken on, he's quite knowledgeable from, from South Africa. So come back on the 25th and we'll go more into that question. Um, next up is uh, Gene, uh, followed by Yusuf, followed by Richard. Let's try to keep the questions down to two minutes because we're getting really close to the end here. So Gene, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, thanks so much, Gabriel. This was really a great talk. And I find myself, I think, in agreement with nearly everything you said. I can't remember anything I disagree with. I, I just wanted to make uh, maybe two points. One um, uh, one point is, as a former Marine, I appreciate your mention of Smedley Butler uh, in the uh, attempted coup of 1936, in which uh, basically he blew the whistle uh, on, on the fascists and said he would not lead a march on Washington. And uh, he has a book, uh, yeah. um, War is a racket, and he's kind of the patron saint of uh, uh, all us ex-Marines. So I just wanted to say that about uh, uh, Smedley Butler. The other thing is, uh, in terms of the threat, uh, I mean, we recognize that uh, Trump is a threat, and really is. And, uh, you know, I, I think the stakes are really serious, because he's quite explicit in terms of, you know, he said that, you know, he'll only be a dictator for one day, but that's all he needs to get rid of all the, you know, these, the lower race of uh, uh, immigrants that are polluting our, our blood, basically, which is taken, I think, directly from, from uh, Hitler. And uh, also, uh, basically, get rid of the communists. And that's us. So I think we have, uh, you know, I've never really felt that I was personally threatened by any of these fascist tendencies, but I just wonder about that. And I wonder how serious the threat of uh, uh, of uh, 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 um, Trump uh, really is. So those are my comments. And again, thank you so much for your discussion. Thank you. I'll be really quick because I do see there's a, there's a ton of questions. I agree with your comments and thank you. The... I think the Trump phenomenon is is pretty dangerous. Uh, Trump round two, I think, is going to be more gloves off than Trump round one. And he's been pretty explicit about where he's headed. It's going to be more authoritarian. It's going to be even more anti-communist. He's going to rev up the war against China, of course, the war against immigrants, of course. Uh, it's going to continue, you know, if he comes into office, which... At this point in time, I'm very sorry to say that's what it's kind of looking like, um, but we'll see what happens. It's also kind of impossible to predict exactly how things will go down, and but we do know that he did everything in his power within the bourgeois state to stay in power and then did some illegal stuff to try to stay in power. So I think these are quite dangerous and intense times, and so what we need to do is to get as organized, as educated, and as connected as possible because uh, things, things could get quite uh, could get quite dark. And so the more power that we build in prior to the storm breaking out, I think the better. And um, yeah, I'm not I'm not particularly optimistic about things getting getting better under uh, Trump if he comes into office. That's for sure. OK, thank you. Yusuf, Yusuf go ahead. Uh, two minutes. Uh, let me briefly answer, try to answer Sharon's question. Um, well, if, if the historic Palestine is um, roughly uh, New Jersey and Delaware. So when you have a um, rest of population, a population that's resisting in such a small area, yeah, then you have a problem um, from the point of view of the Israelis. Uh, uh, OK, I think it's also worth mentioning uh, that once fascists get into power, uh, they actually suppress uh, or, or 
really bring under control the uh, guys, quote unquote, with the uh, baseball bat. And this uh, happened uh, very dramatically in Germany uh, during the um, Night of the Long Knives, where uh, much of the SA was uh, uh, outright killed. Uh, so I wanted to mention that, and if you have any comments on uh, yeah, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right regarding that earlier question that it would be it wouldn't uh, serve Israel's interests now in thinking about it to integrate Palestinians like that into the workforce, because given the genocidal treatment of Palestinians, you can rest assured that almost everyone in Palestine, if not everyone, has family members who have been affected by that genocidal assault, and that tends to radicalize people. And so you risk having a more radicalized anti-Israeli workforce. And if you can get cheaper workers abroad who don't have that connection, I think it's just a really good point that you raised. Yeah, concerning the relationship between parastate and state forces, of course, you're absolutely right. I, I alluded to this very briefly, but there's a way that uh, fascism, since it's often, if not almost always, astroturfed from above, the people from below can be used for different purposes. And often what they want is a kind of mass base to get the vote out or things like this. And so they pitch to a very broad audience. And of course, the Nazis called themselves national socialists for a reason. The reason wasn't because they were socialists. The reason was because they were trying to get some of the workers to vote for them. And they knew that workers, you know, positions were really important and that they were widely supported by the working class. But when both in the case of Germany and Italy, once state power was really consolidated, you didn't need that mass movement as much. And so that could then parts of the elements of the vigilante groups were just integrated into the state. And then the more left wing elements were cut off and, and killed or incarcerated in certain instances. And it's similar to what you see with the Azov Battalion, right? It worked as an, a vigilante organization and then was eventually it had major segments of it, if not the majority of it, integrated into the Ukrainian National Guard. And so that also demonstrates the porosity between parastate and state organizations and the ways that fascism will, when it mobilizes parastate forces, often do it with different communities or with different target groups for particular tactical ends, right? Like if you need to get votes, then why would you have a really consolidated ideology? It's more, it's better to have a diffuse ideology that tries to bring in a larger constituency. Uh, but when you really decide that you're going to go full on authoritarian, you want everybody on uh, the line that you're taking. Um, so that's that's what I'd say about that. But we can move on since there's a lot of questions. Yeah, uh, Richard F. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, um, I was wondering, wanted to ask you about the Democratic Party. In the United States, it's, it's historically been a big problem to the left, uh, politically and theoretically. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I should ask the question, is it liberal or is it fascist? It's a good question. I mean, at one level, obviously, it presents itself as, as liberal and maintains a liberal facade. But it is a party that has historically supported, you know, imperialism uh, repeatedly and with uh, an enormous amount of fervor and support. It's also been behind the mass incarceration industry and has worked hand in glove in various ways with the more repressive uh, elements of the bourgeois state. And so, as I was saying earlier, that the uh, the relationship between fascism and liberalism, I think if it's understood dialectically, the elements of kind of liberalism that you still have within the Democratic Party is that they claim at least that they want to respect the rule of law, people have the right to vote, uh, Bill of Rights, and things like this. And so there is a very, very hollowed out formal democracy that they purport at least to defend. But if you look internationally and in their domestic policy, at least at the level of the bourgeois state, right, they don't empower the vigilante right as much as the Republicans do. But at those other levels, global imperialism and internally, they certainly empower fascism. And so we should be able to be flexible and nuanced enough to say, yeah, it's liberal within the spectrum of a pro-imperialist, pro-police state party within the imperial core that wants to keep certain rights and forms of representation for 
the labor aristocracy of the professional managerial class within the imperial core, because that's their base, really. Um, but internationally, I think that many people would recognize that, you know, it's it's genocide Joe, you know, and people who do this type of thing and back this type of thing could easily be described as fascist in relationship to the global imperialism that they're that they're driving. So I think I think it, my sense was that it was a slightly rhetorical question, um, but it but it is a very good and important rhetorical question. Final note on this is that I think we're in difficult times because it's as well within the imperial core at the level of organizing. We do also have to see that there are tiny differences that still exist between these two camps of the Republicans and the Democrats. They're not absolutely identical. They just absolutely 100 percent share the most important orientations of pro-capitalist, pro-imperialist, anti-communist, etc. But there are some minor differences that I think are important at least to highlight so that one doesn't just go kind of full-on ultra-leftist and throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, or not see slight nuances between the two, if that makes sense. Hey, Richard, right. Yeah, um, I probably should have asked this question earlier on because it's going to be kind of a complicated one, I think. Actually, it's two questions. Uh, one of which is uh, there's been a there's been a bifurcation of the economy into uh, productive capital and financial capital, uh, or that's my assertion in any case. Uh, um, it seems to be that there's a circulation of capital within the financial sector that does not really affect approach the productive sector that differentiate that's differentiated in China, for example. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about that. And the other question I had is uh, there's a race, there's a race by the capitalists to see who can who can uh, populate the uh, the moon and Mars, et cetera. Um, and, you know, in search of resources. I, I think this is the resources element is what sort of stem these two questions. Uh, could you maybe uh, comment on that as well? Thank you. Great question. Uh, yeah, with the relationship between the productive and the financial economy, it I think is clear at this point in time that part of what neoliberalism did in restructuring the global economy was to take the productive basis for the economy that was in the United States, I'll just use that as the example, and then to shift it abroad, you know, Mexico, and then eventually to Asia and other places. And that gutting of the productive economy at home, with the important exception of the arms industry, of course, and yeah. the prison industry and things like this, uh, as well as the culture industries, which are which are largely kept at home, has meant that there's been a major shift to, you know, financial capital and an increase in if you look at, you know, the stats are just amazing with the uh, amount of wealth that is made in the financial sector far, far surpasses that in the productive economy. But during that time, China, for complex and difficult reasons that we could get into, decided with the reform and opening up to basically become the workhouse of the capitalist world. And in doing that, developed a productive basis for their economy that far surpasses what you have in the West. Right. And so you have this major global displacement. And I think that part of the reason that so many contemporary Marxist political economists, or at least in my opinion, the best ones that I've read, have said that neoliberalism is running out of steam because of the uh, gutting of the productive economy at home on almost all, all fronts means that there is no longer the basis for doing really basic things like producing masks during a global pandemic, which we just saw relatively recently. And the fact that the China has such a thriving and flourishing productive economy and also keeps its financial economy under control because the largest banks are state-owned banks, right? And this changes everything, in my opinion, or at least the most important things. And that is a, is a really important difference. And I do think it's one of the reasons that China really functions as a, an alternative to the, the neoliberal model of economics, as much as they did engage with the history of neoliberalism for various, for various reasons, I think largely due to the fact that they were forced to because that was how the global economy was being run. Regarding the source for, you know, the search for resources, I think you're right. Moon exploration and, and all of the, the uh, outer space kind of stuff, I think, is part of that. But it's also just that NASA and in the imperialist search to control space 
is a military endeavor, and it always has been, because if you can control space, you can control the movement of satellites, uh, wow. the basically all of the infrastructure for telecommunications and for spying and all of that is all part of that. And people like Elon Musk and others, of course, they work hand in glove with the U.S. national security state on all these types of projects. That's where they came from in the first place. That's where they're propped up. And that's where they're given state subsidies and, and things like that. And I think that in China's case, you know, I haven't followed their moon program very closely, except for knowing, of course, that it's quite developed. China wanted through the reform and opening up technology transfer from the West, because one of the classic problems in the history of actually existing socialism is that the imperialists will just blockade you and cut you off and not give you any technology transfer. And as long as you have that technological advance, you also have a weapons advance and a military uh, progress that outshines that of the socialist countries. And so what China has been able to do in opening itself up to the West, becoming the productive center, is it would sign contracts that required technology transfer. And now we see China's technological development being quite remarkable. And I think that one of their goals is to be able to put themselves in a position where they're no longer uh, under the kind of, neither under the jackboot of, of, of direct imperialism, nor are they subject to such a technological discrepancy that they wouldn't be able to defend themselves or keep developing themselves beyond the capitalist West. And so I think a lot of the space race is really bound up in this technology race, and obviously the race for resources as well, but that tends to play itself out, at least immediate resources tend to play itself out on planet Earth at this point in time. So very rich okay. question. We could debate all these questions for hours. I'm just trying to give a succinct response. <laughs> we're uh, we're running pretty late. I'm going to ask the last questioners, Norma, one minute. Keep it short. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Norma. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, there's a, uh, uh, there was a broadcast uh, news showing Netanyahu waving a paper, running chest out, from the river to the sea. Yeah, and that's no Jews on Israel with regard to getting a uh, Palestinian workforce. Hey, Janet, would you go ahead and uh, keep, go ahead, one more question. Well, I, I just wanted to clarify the two questions, two of the questions I asked regarding uh, the one about where you see the Muslim countries falling into your paragram, uh, paradigm. I was referring to countries and movements like Yemen, uh, pa the Palestinians, Hezbollah and the like, and um, also including the Saudi-Iran co uh, cooperation. And then um, and then there's Malaysia too. Um, and re regarding uh, the US military police state question, um, the U.S. has 800 bases all around the world acting as the world police to enforce U.S. Imp imperialism. Yeah. And that's that's often a low estimate, right? Some people will say a thousand and all other countries in the world combined have 30 overseas military bases, mm -hmm. just so we can keep it clearly in focus. Great point. Regarding the uh, movements in Yemen and, and Hezbollah and Hamas and things like that. I'm not a specialist, but I've studied them to try to understand geopolitics. And my sense is that these are anti-imperialist movements that want to get the US and the Western imperialist powers and Israel out so that they can have self-determination, but they are grounded as well in religious movements, right? That are actually quite good at organizing people and getting them dedicated and disciplined and keeping them strategically focused on particular goals. Those goals are not socialist goals, right? Those goals are not the same goals as the PFLP, for instance, in the case of uh, Palestine. And so I think not unlike movements for like national bourgeoisies that would be opposed to imperialism, we can recognize them as tactically, as anti-imperialist, playing a significant role because they are fighting back against the spread of imperialism. But strategically, we should not have any illusions about them somehow then leading to, a, of necessity or by consequence, a kind of spread of socialism. 
in each of these cases, though, then you'd have to look at how the different organizations relate to collaborate with or not various Marxist organizations. So in the case of Hamas, of course, they do work with the PFLP. And so there you'd have to descend to a kind of more fine grained level of analysis to see what's going on in, in that regard. Uh, Ali Qadri has a great book on the unmaking of Arab socialism. And I think part of the larger context is that the pan Arab socialist movement has historically been incredibly strong and very, very important. And that part of the goal of US imperialism, particularly the kind of new American century model, has been destroying that socialist alternative, even if those forms of socialism are, aren't like full blown socialism or not absolutely Marxist, they can just be somewhat socialistic in nature, meaning that they provide social welfare for the people, uh, as in the case of Iraq or in the case of Libya or other examples that one could point to. And so I think that from a Marxist vantage point, we really have to be able to be tactically savvy and say, yeah, these anti-imperialists, I think they're doing important work in pushing back, well, strategically, we have to be clear about like, we're not headed in that same direction. We want to get rid of imperialism. But in order to really do that and succeed that in, in the long term, this can't be a project that's rooted in a kind of religious orientation in a religious state. It has to be oriented towards, towards socialism. So hopefully that at least partially addresses the question. Okay, this has been a tremendous session. Um, I want to thank Gabriel for uh, speaking. Wow, I'm sure you're pretty tired. They really, we have some pretty good questioners out there. I want to thank everybody who raised such great questions. A recording of this site, of this uh, session, will be up on our website, a link to it, on um, also on YouTube. Uh, so if you want to watch it, also the Critical Theory Workshop, you should check them out. They're going to have uh, a recording also. Um, we want to encourage everybody to go to our website, icssmarks.org, sign up oh. for uh, future sessions for email notifications. And uh, with that, we're going to say thank you, everybody, and we're going to stop the recording in a moment. So go ahead. Uh, uh, let's just all check out and let's stay together. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. And thank you, Gabriel. It's been a great program. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Keep up the excellent work that you're doing. Thank you. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609 or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org. Dot org.